Uh, go ahead, take your Bibles out, turn to the book of Mark. And we are going to be in Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 27. We're going to go to uh, chapter 12, verse 12 uh, in just a moment. And I'm actually going to get into the text really quickly this morning. Uh, we don't have an elaborate setup or anything like that. Really, what Jesus is doing is building on where, what we've uh, been going through the last couple of weeks. And so though this time that we have together this morning stands alone, so if you've missed the last couple of weeks, okay. Uh, I would recommend that you go back, kind of get the fullness of what Jesus is doing over the last couple of weeks. Um, but this builds on that. And so it's a little bit of a part two or three even to the last couple of weeks of what Jesus has been doing. Um, and I love how, as we get into the text this morning, um, really every time we open God's word, every time we seek him in prayer, every time we gather together with him at the center of what we're seeking to be about and give glory to and grow in, uh, the gospel really opens our eyes to so many different things. It, and it has this ability, and it's the only thing like it, uh, it has the ability to both convict and then to also restore uh, the ability to, to really press us and confront us, but then to encourage us and lift us up. The, the ability to make us aware of our need to lay our lives down, but then it gives us the reality of what actually builds our lives up. Uh, it's the beautiful story of God's word, and there is no other word like it. It is living and active. And, and so I want to pray for us that, that God would speak to us through his word this morning as we, as we read his text. So God, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together and to worship you together and to hear voices lifted up to you. God, thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and to talk to people and to build community and the opportunity that we'll have to hear your word now and the opportunity that we will have afterwards to, to talk with one another and to to build one another up, to pray for one another, to, to center relationship around you as you have designed us to so that we can thrive and flourish and experience joy and encouragement and, and challenge and we can grow into a, a deeper likeness of our creator and, and experience the joy that only comes in so doing. And so God, I pray that just holistically this morning, not only through worship and your word and our, and our corporate time together, but also just as the body gathers. God, we know that the church is no longer a place, but it is your people. And so God, I pray that we would experience you this morning. I pray that we would go out on mission this week. I pray that you would use your word this morning to convict us and to uplift us. I pray that you would uh, make us aware of blind spots that perhaps are in our own lives, that we might lay them down at your feet and begin to pursue you with all of our hearts and experience the joy that comes in giving you glory in all things. And so God, speak to us in your word. I pray that it would prove itself once again to be living and active. And, and no matter what we're going through here this morning in each of our hearts and our minds and the, the things that we're bringing in, the prayer requests that we have, the struggles that we are going through, the joys that we are experiencing, wherever we are, God, in our lives, I pray that you would speak directly to us, that we would hear from you, and that we would see how we need to move forward in you and give us a passion and desire to pursue you with all of our hearts. And so God, we give this time to you and pray these things in your holy and precious name. Amen. Um, here in this text, as we read it, here's what you're going to see. We're going to see Jesus bring this extreme claim of authority. It, it kind of could be easy to kind of pass right over when we just read the text. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about it before we get to it. But this is perhaps Jesus's greatest claim to who he is in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we've seen throughout the Gospel of Mark Jesus claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be God, claiming to come with the authority uh, of God, claiming that he will go to the cross to pay for the penalty of our rebellion and sin against God, that he would restore us by his grace into community with God and give us right relationship with his creation and one another so that we're no longer having to seek life in the things that he has created, but we have life in the creator so we can live a life of revealing life and that we have in him and him alone in everything we do and everywhere we go with everything we have, that we might live in the freedom of who we are designed and intended to be that only comes because of his work for us and by his grace and through our faith in the reality that he is all that we need. 
And the more we surrender to him, the greater life we actually experience, the more joy. So we've seen this claim to authority, but this one is an incredible claim to authority. We're also going to see a threat. It's a threat to the religious leaders of the day. It's a threat to the irreligious. It's a threat to us as the people of God. If we are a follower of Christ, it is something that we need to look inside our hearts and minds and go, is, is this something that defines who I am? Or am I actually walking in the deep realities of who I am in Christ? And then there's also a beautiful promise a promise of what it looks like to walk in him and to be free in him. And so as we've been walking through the last couple of weeks, uh, just really quickly so we can jump into the the text and know exactly where we are. Uh, If you've been with us, Jesus has gone to some 35 different towns, cities. He's proclaiming who he is. He's performing miraculous works to demonstrate the truth of what he is saying. And he has now come into Jerusalem. And ultimately, he's going to the temple. Once again, he has lived the life that we couldn't live. We were created to be in community with God through sin and rebellion. Each of our desires to be our own rulers and to build our own kingdoms. We have rebelled against God and in so doing, separated ourselves from the community we're created to have with him. It brings confusion, disunity. We're all trying to build things up. We'll talk about that even just a little bit more in a moment. But Jesus comes to live the life that we failed to live and to die to pay the penalty of our rebellion against God and restore community with him by rising from the dead to defeat all that is defeating us and keeping us from the life we were created and intended and designed to experience in community with God. Giving us right relationship, as I said, to everything else, to be able to experience joy and freedom in life. And this is what he has been proclaiming. He's coming to the temple to to make the point that he is the Messiah, that he is the presence of God on earth, that, that he has come to do what only he can do. And so he walks into Jerusalem, and most of us know the story. If you've grown up in church at all, if you've been on on Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday, you've heard the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey, palm branches going down before him, people crying out, Hosanna in the highest, meaning save us, save us now. They believe that he is coming in to bring them out of oppression and build up a physical kingdom, which Jesus is coming to bring all out of oppression who place their faith in him, to to give us the life that we were created to have, to place us in the kingdom that we ultimately long for with him as king. But he's doing it in a way that foundationally saves us at the soul heart level. He's not coming to build a physical kingdom that will rise and fall, but an eternal kingdom where we can live and be with him for all of eternity. And and the people aren't understanding this. And so Jesus, after he comes into the city, he goes to the temple. He's standing there with all the lambs that will be slaughtered. Josephus, a historian, tells us about 255,000 lambs will be sold the week of the Passover. And, And Jesus is standing there knowing that he is the sacrificial lamb, that he is the one who has come to give his life for the ransom of many, all those who have placed their faith in him. He goes back up to the Mount of Olives and all of this over the last several weeks we've, we've discussed in detail. But he goes back to the east of the city. He comes back the next day and he sees a fig tree. And he makes this living parable about the fig tree and hypocrisy and and really challenges our hearts to live as who we proclaim to be in him. To look at the fruit of our lives. And he goes into the temple and there's another famous story of scripture. And he begins to turn over tables in the temple. Not out of an anger that's a sinful, unrighteous anger, but a righteous anger. We talked about how he is, they're worshiping false gods. And so as he comes in to tip over the tables and to to push over the money changers tables, he's actually doing so like we might kind of storm into a home that's that's housing and enslaving people and, and trafficking them all over the world. And we would come in and we wouldn't be worried about damaging property. We're only worried about setting people free and breaking the chains of oppression and allowing people to live in true freedom. And this is what Jesus does in the temple. He's turning over the table saying you're worshiping false gods you're oppressing yourself you're you're shackling yourselves and and I am the one true savior who will set you free and this is to be a house of prayer for all nations that all who place their faith in me 
would know salvation and life. And then again, he goes back onto the Mount of Olives. And now, when we get into our text, he's going back to the temple. It's Tuesday of what we call Passion Week. And passion coming from the Latin word pati, and it means suffering. And so this is the suffering week of Jesus, the Passion Week of Jesus. And and it's always been an interesting term to me, but, but certainly when we're, when we're passionate about something, there's a certain pain in it, there's a suffering in it, there's a longing for it to be understood and to be known. And this is Jesus's not only suffering physically for us, but the passion, the longing for us to understand who he is. And he begins to put this on display as he enters into the temple for the second time. This is what happens in Mark chapter 11, verse 27. And they, Jesus and the disciples and his followers, come into Jerusalem. And as he was walking into the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, it's very interesting that that they do this, but we'll talk about this in just a second. If we say that he's from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe in him? But shall we say from man? And they were afraid of the people, for they held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then we get another parable. He explains what he just said to the religious leaders. And he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he, the owner, sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so with many others. So they beat and they, some, and they killed some, and he still uh, sent another, this time a beloved, his beloved son. Finally, he sent to them, saying, they will respect my son. Verse 7, but those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him outside of the vineyard. Remember that. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in his eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. So as we look at this text, obviously there's a lot happening here. It it goes together. Jesus is saying something, this massive critique to the religious leaders and and certainly applies to our hearts as the church today. Uh, And then he gives this example. He, he, He gives them something to help them understand and they get it. They perceive exactly what Jesus is doing. And that's my prayer for us this morning as we look at this text. And so again, it's Tuesday morning. Jesus is going into Jerusalem again the very next Friday. Just a few days from this time, he will be hanging on the cross for our sin. On Sunday, he would rise from the grave. He had just turned the tables. And all of that backstory is what leads to the religious leaders asking this question. And so when Jesus walks into the temples with his followers and the disciples, and he walks in, and the religious leaders look at him and immediately come up to him and ask him this question, this is the backstory, this is why. Jesus had just walked in and and turned over tables, and then he had begun to speak with authority about who he was and what he had come to set up to do and how he was going to save those who had placed their faith in him. And so all of this that Jesus said and done had just happened and now he's walking back into the temple and everybody you better bet is looking at Jesus. What is this dude going to do today? Yesterday was a real trip, right? He walked in and turned the tables over. So the religious leaders beeline to him 
And they have this question because here's what they need to do. The, the city of Jerusalem is really on this brink of revival, this brink of spiritual awakening. Like, who is this Jesus? Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that we've been waiting on? Is he going to rise us out of oppression? Are we to worship him? He just came into the temple and totally flipped upside down, literally and figuratively, everything we have believed religiously and everything we've done to pursue him. And he says it's all by his grace through faith that he is going to bring salvation and restore his people. So they're all kind of looking at him like, what is happening? Is he the one? And so the religious leaders, they've got to do something. They've either got to lay their life down and worship him as the God that he is, or they've got to try to regain authority. Their authority is really in question, and their pride is going to be revealed. Is there humility to seek real truth, or is there a pride to make our own truth and do whatever we have to do to live up to it and, pre and suppress everything that might come against it? So this is the question, and, and it's an important question. It's also good for us to know that it's a common question. In the first century, when you have a rabbi or religious leader walking into a new town or into a synagogue or the temple, for sure, uh, you would have other religious leaders come over to them, and they would want to know, by whose authority do you come? Uh, who did you study under? Where'd you go to school? What do you do? What have you done? Like, what's your resume? Why should we listen to you? By what authority are you coming? Are you a false teacher or are you someone that we should listen to? And they're trying to kind of figure out who Jesus is and if they should listen to him. And they believe that they have the upper hand in this situation because they actually know who Jesus is. And by the way, if you were to answer wrongly in the first century, especially specifically in the temple, then the Mishnah actually tells us, a, a book of Jewish laws, that if you were a false teacher who came from a false authority, then you could actually be imprisoned or even killed by trying to profess a truth that was false. So they're trying to trap Jesus, and they think they have this upper hand because they know once they ask this question and everybody's gathering around to hear Jesus' answer, here's this Jesus who is walking in, and guess what? He's kind of like a pseudo-rabbi. Like, he didn't study under anybody in the day. Uh, he doesn't have a, a long resume history of following another rabbi. He kind of was a carpenter from Nazareth which is the prophecy that says nothing good comes from Nazareth. And he grew up a carpenter's son. And all of a sudden, he tells these fishermen to start following him, which we talked about in the book of Mark at the beginning. It's not the way it typically would happen, that he's going in pursuit of disciples. And this, this whole thing is just flipped upside down. And we've talked over and over and over again about how the kingdom of God is, is upside down to the way we see naturally the kingdoms that we try to build. But it's ultimately what we long for. And Jesus is continuing to reveal that, but they're just thinking, you don't have authority. Like, you don't have a good resume. And so they're trying to trap him to say, whatever you say, we're going to be able to say is false. At best, maybe we can totally get rid of you, which we'll see later in the week on Friday. But at least maybe we can gain a little bit of authority from some of these people in the temple. And they'll just, they'll kind of re, uh, kind of look at religion and the way that we're pursuing things as the way to live and to go. So here's Jesus getting this question. I just want to throw out there for us, though it was also a common question in the first century, this is something that is common for us to ask as well. And I want us to understand that, that though we have come a long way in some ways and a lot of time has passed, when we look at Scripture and we're asking the question, how do we bring the truths of Scripture a couple thousand years forward into our culture and see how it applies? Though there are cultural things happening that we try to discuss here every single week and figure out and wrestle with so we can understand the truth of the text, it's really not hard for us to apply it to our hearts. Because though many things have changed, the hearts have remained the same. And because naturally we are not giving glory and honor to God and putting him at the center of all that we are and living to reveal him, but we're living to seek what we lost and do not have in communion with him naturally in the things of the world and trying to build our own kingdoms and be our own kings and establish our own identities and create our own worth, 
When we look at the world around us and people around us, we want to know by what authority, where can I place you in the scale of who I need to listen to to best help me, to best build me up? Who do I need to put down to build myself up? How are you going to help me with my kingdom or get in the way of my kingdom? We judge other people naturally by their backgrounds, their culture, where they've been, where they've gone to school, what they've learned, who they've studied under. It is a natural thing for us to do because we're all trying to build our own kingdoms naturally. But what it turns out to be and to produce is confusion. It never actually satisfies us. We become enslaved to the things of the world because we have to have them to build ourselves up and we can't lose them or else we lose what we have already built and gained. And so we're in constant fear and anxiety. Every relationship we look at, we're trying to use the other people to fill us because there's an emptiness in us that we need other people to fulfill. And so we're constantly in disunity because nobody can live up to the expectation that we put on them. Only God can fulfill our hearts. We were created for community with him and through that community, community with others. And if we get that backwards and we're looking to be fulfilled in community with others, then it will never lead to actual love. It will always lead to using one another in disunity. So when we try to build kingdoms in the world, it always leads to confusion. It never satisfies. It always leads to disunity. It always leads to judgment. It always leads to division. And and this is what we typically do, even all the way down in our culture to the way we dress. I I had a um, a friend in college, um, and he, I'm not suggesting this to you, but he would just love to do this type of stuff, experiment. So this is not scientific at all, but just see if it's true. All right. He would actually go places uh, one day and then the next day. And the first day he would either wear a suit or scrubs. He was not a doctor and he did not have a job where he needed to wear a suit. But this is what he would do. And then he would go to the same place wearing his PJs. And he would just see places like airports and convenience stores and everything like that. And he would constantly be telling me stories about when he would even go into a convenience store wearing a suit or scrubs. People would almost always allow him to go in front of him in line. They felt like he was busy and and going somewhere quick. And so they were were nicer to him, treated him different. Uh, But when he wore his his pajamas, it was a totally different story. It was just kind of neutral. And, and we do this today. We kind of size people up by how they dress and, and, and ultimately their culture and where they've gone to school, what their jobs are, all of these different kinds of things. We're trying to judge status and worth. Do they carry power? Do they carry something that we need? Do, do we need them on our side or do we need to suppress them? This is how we measure things in the world around us and certainly in our culture. I mean, walk around with just a shirt that says, I went to Harvard, and then walk around with a Panthers jersey. <laughs> like, people are going to look at you totally different. Like, why in the world are you, you know, cheering for the Panthers, right? Um, that's how they're going to look at you. Like, you are clearly not smart. Um, and so, so this is just what we do. This is how we live. This is how our culture goes about creating itself. Where do I fit? Who am I? What is my value? And we see this constantly. And even in our pursuit, because we were created in the image of God, to, to love one another and to care for one another. And, and, and no matter where you are and where you're from and what you've done, I love you and care for you. It will never actually happen. Because that can only take place from a place of value, not trying to gain value. It can only take place when we understand who we were created to be and walk in intent and design in the freedom of who we are in our creator and community with him, full and satisfied so that we are revealers of what we have in him and not seekers of a life we don't have in his creation. As long as we are people who seek and do not understand who we are in God, who is the only one who saves us by his grace, that doesn't make us do something to have salvation, every other religion, every other philosophy, every every other moral, life-living way that we look irreligiously at being a good person. It's all about what we do. And as long as that is the case, there will always be disunity, and there will always be insecurity, and it will never satisfy 
God is the only one who says, I came for you, I did the work for you, I save you by grace, I make you who you are in me by you surrendering to me, and then you can begin to live out the freedom I designed you to experience, and then you know how to relate to community and to creation. Only in him. But in the, in the world that we live in, we judge. And, and this is how we figure out who measures up. And, and so they're just doing this. This is exactly what they're doing. And I'm spending the most of our time here because I need us to understand this before we see the story that just takes place. But they're thinking, okay, we can regain some authority. People certainly are going to think we have studied under these rabbis and we have this past and we have this history and here's our culture and here's what we've developed and everybody's looking up to us and following us religiously. And then here's this Jesus who comes from Nazareth. And he's a carpenter's son. And he didn't follow any famous rabbis. So they're pretty confident that they've got him. And I just wish that I could walk up, right? This is the perfect place to be a fly on the wall. But I just wish I could be there just walking the, watching them walk up with this kind of the smug attitude. Like, we saw what you did yesterday, but we're about to put you in your place. And again, because of their pride, they're not even asking, is he true? They're just trying to suppress him. This can so often happen in our own lives. And, and, and we're looking at this, as I said, the precipice of this revival in Jerusalem, this spiritual awakening and revolution of sorts that we so desperately, just as a side note, need today in our culture. And it's the very people of God. Let this be a warning to us. It's the very people of God that keep the truth of God from going forth to those who need it. Let us not be a people who in our pride or whatever it may be, keep the truth of Jesus from being revealed to a city that needs it as we go to our neighborhoods and our places of work and into our hobbies. Let us carry the banner of who we are in Christ everywhere that we go. This is what is missing. It's not the church gathering. It's the church scattering. It's the missing, missing apologetic. We talk about collaborating as the people of God and then going out into our city and just think of every church who believed and taught the gospel and every believer who was transformed by the gospel truth left their churches in our city and went out on mission to reveal his glory, not to build our own kingdoms, but to reveal the kingdom of God, not to build our, our own pride up and to judge, but to love as Christ has loved us. Us, then what would we see take place? Might the glory of God spread across our city in ways that we can't even imagine? And are we as a church, is the church, are you as an individual, one who in pride is leaving this place to go out into the world to build your own kingdom rather than surrendering to him, to seek life as others are seeking life rather than to reveal the life that you have in Christ. Let's not be a people who as the, the brink of spiritual revival occurs, we begin to say, whoa, 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 whoa. What would that mean for me? And my kingdom, let's count the cost and be willing to lay it all down. So here's what they say. What authority are you doing these things in? In other words, here's what we need to understand. Not only the question and why, or the question and, and what they're actually asking, but the, the motive behind it. Because here's the motive behind this question. What right do you have? What right do you have to tell us how to live and to tell us what to do and to tell us how to use our things? And that's the real question they're asking Jesus. What right do you have to tell us how to live, to tell us what to live for? This is the foundation of the question. It's the motive of the heart. This is, this is what we have to ask ourselves are we a people who are saying, God, what right do you have? What right do you have to tell me how to live and how to use my things and, and, and what to do with my life and what it means to actually walk in freedom? And I just want to do whatever I desire to do. And, and again, this is what they're asking. And when we get to the end of the text, they are actually not rejecting Jesus because they don't know who he is or he's not who he says he is. They reject Jesus because they know exactly who he is and they don't want him. May this, again, not be true of us. 
But we are a people, just to, just to lay it out so we can investigate our own hearts. We're a people who struggle with any kind of mass authority. Sure, we'll measure people up. And maybe in this place, in this setting, you have a little bit of authority. And I'll look up to you in that area. But, but anybody is just like, I've got to surrender my life to this thing. Like we push back against that in our culture. We think that any mass authority is just dogma and it's divisive. It's oppressive. It, it keeps me from my, being myself. It, it's a strike against my personal autonomy and purpose and value. And people should just be able to find their own truth for themselves. And no one has the right to tell other people what to do or how to live or what to think or who to be. Which actually, in reality, are dogmatic statements in and of themselves about ultimate truth. And they create division. See, it goes back to what I said. Everything that we're trying to do to build our own kingdoms in the world, even our best attempts lead to truth claims that develop division all amongst us. There's only one salvation from it. And the fact is, every single one of us live under authoritative claims. We're all growing up in cultures and with parents and different beliefs that are all being told to us. Everything that we know, the the religious leaders get this. Everything we know when we're bringing together is derivative. It comes from another place of authority. It's something that's been passed down that we've learned. And that's why they're asking this question, by whose authority are you coming to us and teaching these things? Because we all know innately that knowledge has been passed down and truth claims have been kind of cultivated in our hearts and in our minds, religiously and, and through history and the culture that we grow up in. Who gave you that authority? And then we develop these thoughts and we give authority to different things that we have learned from, whatever it may be. And all of this plays a part in us making ultimate truth things that we live by in our lives, whether it's religiously or irreligiously. All of us have authorities. All of us worship something to gain some sort of life. All of us are doing this. Here's the good news, though. Contrary to popular belief, authority isn't bad unless you're under bad authority. And because all of us have naturally gone away from the authority we were created to be under and thrive and flourish and experience joy and life in, and we are giving authority to things that were never meant to be given authority to, and we are worshiping and using the creation rather than worshiping the creator, then we are all under bad authority. And we push back on it. But there is a good authority that actually gives life. So all of us find our lives under authority. The question is, what authority should we place our lives under? And is there a good authority that that actually allows us to flourish? See, authority isn't bad. The the age-old example is like a fish in water, right? If the fish just does anything it it wants to do and comes out of the water, it can't actually thrive and live. But as long as it lives as, as it is designed, then it can flourish. We have this idea that freedom is the freedom to do whatever we want, but it's actually to do what we are designed to do, listen, to the greatest extent. And the question is, and the great quest of all of life is is not how are we to become the masters of our own fate and the captains of our own souls, but to find authority that tells us how we're actually designed. How do we actually live the way we're intended to? How do we function in it? What gives us the power to pursue it and to live in it and to reveal it? To know an ultimate truth and not seek it in power and success and earthly authorities. And and Jesus knows all of this, of course. And so this is what he begins to, to lay out. He thinks, I know that you think you have the upper hand, but what he knows is that he actually has the upper hand. And the idea is that they're going to catch Jesus. He's going to give a false authority. They're going to be able to imprison him or kill him. And they're going to gain authority back. And they're not even asking the question because of their pride, what is actually true. But they're just trying to suppress something that is against what they have built. This is the setting. And then Jesus gives this response that is absolutely, once we know that setting, staggering. 
It's unbelievable. I mean, it is so incredible. And uh, time and time again, we've seen the religious leaders bring a question to Jesus to try to trap him. And we've learned time and time again, you don't try to trap God. But here's what they do. And they ask him this question. And in true rabbi fashion, he answers the question with a question. And and it's, it's kind of more of a question like a good life coach would ask you. Um, several of our staff here are, are trained to uh, coach church planters that are planting in other places in our state. Um, and one of the things that we learn to do is not just to prescribe what other churches should do and what other church plants should do, but to ask the right questions, to probe in the right places. And maybe you've had a conversation like this with a good life coach or something like that, um, where you're just kind of talking and they're asking questions and it feels like you're kind of leading the conversation, but actually they're leading it with their questions. And then by the time you get to the end of the conversation, you walk away going, man, all I needed to do was just have a sounding board. Like, man, I got all of this out and I answered all my questions and and just talking through it. All of a sudden I have this clarity on what I need to do and what I need to pursue and how I need to live and what I need to go after. And, And ultimately what's happening there is that the right questions have been asked to you for you to come to the right conclusions. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. Rabbis would often do this in the first century. And so Jesus says, let me ask you something. And if you answer it, I'll answer your question. But in reality, they're going to answer their own question. He says, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And the answer to this is actually, if you remember who John the Baptist was, we talked about this back in Mark chapter 1. And in Mark chapter 1, we see that John the Baptist is somebody who comes uh, as a forerunner of Jesus. He's revealing that the Messiah is coming. And he is, John is baptizing with water, but he says the whole, the, the, the Messiah is going to come and baptize with the Holy Spirit. He's going to bring salvation to his people. And he's going to bring them out of oppression. He is going to save all who place their faith in him. And he's pointing towards the Messiah just before Jesus comes. And as Jesus goes before John and and John baptizes Jesus and he comes out of the water and the heavens split open and a dove descends on Jesus like the Holy Spirit and the Father, this voice comes and says, this is my, remember our text, beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then Jesus begins to proclaim who he is and what he has come to do. And so John was seen as a prophet for the one who is coming, the Messiah. But it goes further back. That's something the people believe, but the religious leaders are struggling with that just a little bit, we read in our text. So it actually goes further back when he talks about John. All the way back to the Old Testament, which the religious leaders would believe. They would hold to. And so what Jesus is doing is pulling from John's actual life, but then also right out of Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And this is what it says. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That's John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Jesus has come to the temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? They're pressing against him. Who can stand when he appears? For he is like the refiner's fire. He calls us out of our own kingdoms. He calls us to surrender to him and not build our own kingdoms and be our own kings. Like the fuller soap. He will sit at a refiner as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, who the religious leaders. He's going to come into the temple. He's going to lay out who he is. It's going to be against the religion that they have built and the kingdoms that we pursue. And it's going to be like a refiner's fire, and nobody is going to like it. But John will come before him and say that the Messiah is coming, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord, it says. And so in Mark, we get the story of John the Baptist coming before Jesus. In Malachi, we get the prophecy of the coming Messiah and of John the Baptist. And so when Jesus asked this question, this is the depth of this question, the beauty of it. And this is why they respond the way that they do. He says, answer me this question. Do you believe that John the Baptist was from God or not? Was he a prophet or not? And rather than them immediately answering, they go, ooh, we got to huddle on that. And at this moment... 
they are realizing they have made a major mistake. They should never, if they could, this would be the time to abort mission. Like they should never have asked the question and all of a sudden they get it. Because what Jesus is doing is saying, you believe that the Messiah was going to send a forerunner who is John the Baptist. You believe Malachi and that Jesus is going to come to the temple, the Messiah, and I have come to the temple, and he is going to turn over, he's going to refine the temple, and I have turned over the tables, and John has come, and who do you believe Malachi's authority comes from? You yourselves, religious leaders, believe that the authority comes from God. And who was John the Baptist who said that I would come, who fulfills the, the, the Malachi prophecy, who now I have walked into the temple and refined, and John was pointing towards who? Me. And who do the people believe that John's authority came from? God. And so he's going, you believed in this authority, and, and this authority is God. And then John came, and his authority was from God. And John was pointing towards me, and I am the fulfillment of Malachi. And so what I am telling you today by you needing to answer my question is that I am the actual authority over all things. I am the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I am the Messiah that John was pointing towards. I am not coming from the authority of anyone. I am the authority. I am life. I am truth. I am salvation. I am the cornerstone of everything. And anything else you put your foundation of life on, it will crumble. I alone provide everything that you were created for and desire and long for. And sadly, when this all dawns on them, instead of them bowing down and repenting and worshiping him because of their pride, God is standing right in front of them and they miss him. They do not find their salvation in him. Listen to me. Do not allow pride to get in the way of you having life and salvation. Of finding yourself in the kingdom that you were created for with the king that you were created to know all things in and through. Whose power allows you to walk in freedom. Whose work allows you to walk in his grace that sets you free from who you have been, to worship the God who created you and to reveal him in all things, to have joy and freedom, to walk in your intent and design. Don't let pride get in the way. I have a, uh, I read this in the, the first service, so I'll read it to you. I, I keep this in my Bible and it's just uh, 30 seconds of extra for you. It's a poem by Beth Moore. It's called, My Name is Pride. It says, my name is pride, I am a cheater. I cheat you out of your God-given destiny because you demand your own way. I cheat you out of contentment because you deserve better than this. I cheat you out of knowledge because you already know it all. I cheat you out of healing because you are too full of you to forgive. I cheat you out of holiness because you refuse to admit when you are wrong. I cheat you out of vision because you'd rather look in the mirror than out the window. I cheat you out of genuine friendship because nobody is going to know the real you. I cheat you out of love because real romance demands sacrifice. I cheat you out of greatness in heaven because you refuse to wash another's feet on earth. I cheat you of God's glory because I convince you to seek your own. My name is Pride. I am a cheater. You like me because you think I'm always looking out for you. Untrue. I'm looking to make a fool of you. God has so much for you, I admit. But don't worry. If you stick with me, you'll never know. Don't allow the authority of your own heart, the desire to make your own way, get in the way of what is true and life-giving. Today, we have an opportunity to surrender all that we are or to suppress it. But the truth is, when we come into contact with Jesus and who he is, we either repent and follow or we seek to kill him, to push him aside, to throw him away. And this is what ultimately will happen in three days. 
And so they get in their little huddle and they go, what do we actually say? If we say that his authority is from God, then, then we're the bad guys. But if we say that his authority isn't from God, then we're the bad guys. And so it's like Jesus just trapped us and we're really between a rock and a hard place. There's nothing that we can actually say. And so they turn around and they just go, we don't know. We're going to try to save tail as much as we possibly, we just don't know. Right? Never mind, Jesus, you don't have to answer us. Like, we're just going to back away now. And so Jesus doesn't answer them, but then he gives us this parable. And I'll go over this just in really short, just a couple of minutes. Look in chapter 12. He goes through this parable of, of describing to us the fiery trial, the, the threat that comes against us, the, the thing that we need to look out for. And then he gives us this promise. He tells the story of a vineyard. And in those days, vineyards and grapevines were all over the place. And people would have these fields of them with wine presses. And what you would do is you would put hedges around all of your, your land, a tower in the middle, as described in our text, for people to look out over to make sure that no thieves or animals come in uh, to take your crops. And then you would have a wine press in the middle to make wine. Or depending on your background, this is how they created, well, just grape juice, right? Um, and so they would, they would have wine, and it was actually um, with olive oil. It was their source of, of resources. It was their economy to produce wine and olive oil. This is, this is what the first century was all about there in and near Jerusalem. And so the owner of the vineyard, to care for it, would hire tenants to watch over it. And then usually they would live a few miles down the road, but if not, in this case, the, the owner is actually in a different place. And then they would send servants to check on the land because it was so lucrative. And you had to put a lot into it. And it took years to get your, your wine vineyard to be in a lucrative space. So owners really cared about it. And they would come and check on it and they would get samples. What, what, are the, what are our fruits going to yield this year? And they want to know how lucrative it is going to be for them. So the owner would send servants. And in this case, the owner sends servants and the tenants in their pride desire to be owners. They're going, what authority do you have to tell us how to do what we are doing? We're the ones that are doing the work. We're the ones that are producing. We're the ones that should get to decide what we want to do with the fruit and with the crops and with the wine. And, and, and so what right do you have to live over there on your high horse and call yourself an owner when we're the ones doing the work and building the kingdom? This is how they think. And so the owner sends a servant and they beat him. And then he sends another and they beat him. And then he sends another and they kill him. And then he thinks, I will sin, catch this, my beloved son. And I will send my son with the authority of the owner. And surely the tenants will listen to the authority of the owner, that, that they would understand that they are stewards of everything they have been given and not owners of everything, that it is not their kingdom. But when they live in the way that the owner has allowed them to, then they have the blessing of food and blessing of water and blessing of home and blessing of joy. They have everything that they need to live and thrive and flourish. But when they try to take over, they're not in their right place. They're trying to be the owner rather than the steward and the owner will come in and wipe it out and give it to new tenants. And immediately it starts clicking for them. They're like, just, this just went from bad to way worse. Because what Jesus is saying is, God sent to his people prophet after prophet after prophet but the people saw themselves as owners of the kingdom and of the land and everything that they could build. And they beat and they killed and they imprisoned. And then finally the son comes, the beloved Messiah, to bring restoration and to bring forgiveness and to show grace. And rather than repenting and bowing down in their pride, they cast him out of the city and they put him on a cross and they take his life and they think if we get rid of the son, it will all be ours. And what Jesus is saying is, if you get rid of the son, you're getting rid of your actual salvation. There is only one cornerstone of life. And if it's not built on him, with him as the center, if you're rejecting him to be an owner of your own life and your own kingdom, to be your own king, then it will never flourish and it will fall. 
And eventually the owner will take out all of those who reject him. But Jesus, in this case, came to give his life so that we might place our faith in him and surrender to him and have a thriving life that we are created to know and experience. This is the beauty of what Jesus is saying here. And so let me close with this. I just want us to test our own hearts this morning. I want, I want us to, to look inside of ourselves and say, am I, am I surrendering or am I prideful? A- am I seeing myself as an owner or am I seeing myself as a steward? One will bring life and thriving and the other death. And as I was thinking about this this week, I, I really saw, I'm just going to give them to you, I'm just going to rattle them off. But I saw four ways in which we have this dichotomy between stewardship and ownership. The first one is godlessness. It's the idea that I am the owner and I am the steward. I'm self-made. I'm independent. I do it myself. It's all mine. I get, nobody can tell me what to do. I I made it myself. I lead myself and I get to decide what to do with everything that I have. This is the dominant way that culture views itself today. I am the owner and I am the steward. The second one is selfish religious a selfish religious heart. I am the owner and God is the steward. I am the owner and God is the steward. It's my life and and God should do what I want him to do. I'm living in these religious ways. This is the way the religious leaders saw it. I'm being moral. I'm a good person. I've really risen myself above most others and and I'm doing really great. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to to pat us on the back and the Messiah comes and calls us to repent and my pride just won't let that happen. I've got to suppress it. I've got to push it down because it it is crushing my kingdom. And and when we look at God, we think uh, I've done everything that God has called me to do. I'm a good religious person. And and this is why we get angry when he doesn't do what we want him to, because I'm the owner and God, you're supposed to be the steward. You're supposed to bless my plan. If you love me, you're supposed to heal me. If you, if you are actually good, then, then you should give me wealth. You should see life the way that I see life. And this is so often what we do. I would call this the dominant view in the church. The third is the lazy Christian. It's God is the owner and the steward. Nothing's going to happen if God just doesn't do it. And, and, and I'm just going to kind of relax. And it's this Jesus take the wheel mentality. I, I have no responsibility in the whole thing. Like if God's going to do it, he'll do it. I'm just kind of going through life. It, it's all good. Whatever he does, whatever he doesn't, it, it's all about him. And we take no stewardship at all. And then finally, there's the follower of Jesus. God is the owner, and I am the steward. God is the owner, and I am the steward. Everything is his, and everything that he allows us to have, we hold with open hands, because it's all for his glory. And this takes us away from being enslaved from the things that we have in the world, and fearing losing them, and fearing not gaining them, because I have everything that I need in God, and everything that he gives to me, I can actually enjoy I can actually give and love and and, and reveal everything that he has given me as a gift and and it can be a gift to reveal him to others and I can actually enjoy it without being enslaved by it. Where is your heart today? Are you an owner or are you a steward? If we're owners, it will control us, but if we are stewards, we can live in the freedom of the salvation we have in Christ who is the cornerstone.